Okay. Fuel and emissions test four. Technician A says a paper test could detect a, detect a burned valve. Technician B says a grayish white stain could be a coolant leak. Okay, which technician is correct about that? Is it gray and white? Both of them. You know, basically, you're going to look at both of those guys. Um, sometimes you could, um, if you got coolant getting in on top of a piston, you know, you can sometimes, if you put dye in the coolant, you can see it with a black ladder. If you pull the head off, and you can actually see these little grayish, greenish, white places where antifreeze has been cooked onto the head of the piston and all that. I've seen that before. Two technicians are discussing oil leaks. Technician A says an oil leak can be found using a fluorescent dye in the oil with a black light detector for leaks. We've done that here. Technician B says a white spray powder can be used to locate oil leaks. Who's right about that? Yeah, like Dr. Scholes, you know. We had a, uh, one time there was this uh, Dodge Stratus that belonged to the daughter of one of the instructors here. Uh, down in Tallahassee, and they uh, went to some shop to see it because they had an oil leak. And the shop told them the rear main oil seal was leaking. It was going to be a thousand dollars to fix it. And so he says, "Well, I figured we might want to just take a get a second opinion." So he brought it up here, and we kind of cleaned it up. And we put uh, dye in it, and the oil was coming from beneath the cylinder head. Now you know there's a pressurized oil passage that goes up through the cylinder head on overhead cam engines. If it's got an over, if you've got a camshaft, it's spinning in some little. Uh, saddles that need to be lubricated. They won't always be cam bearings. It's kind of like it's kind of like a Briggs and Stratton, you know, connecting rod. There's no bearing. It's just the, it's spinning in there. Long and short of it is, uh, that O-ring that lets that pressurized oil go through that gasket uh, comes up there. It can leak out from under that cylinder head. That particular engine, uh, the, that pressurized oil leak goes through that cylinder head, coming I mean, back at the corner, and. Uh, so we found that leak and we put a cylinder head gasket on it. It didn't need a rear main oil seal. You got me? Because the, in order to make sure, see it was dripping off the bottom of the bell housing. And anytime you see oil dripping off the bell housing down there at the base of it, uh, you can't categorically say that's rear main oil seal. Because on a V8, like a silly V8 engine, it can be leaking from the intake gasket and it can run down. And on that particular one, it was leaking from under the cylinder head and it was running down. And what happens there is they put the they, they do the thousand dollar rear main oil seal, you know, and it's still leaking. And they say, well, we got some of it, we didn't get all of it. Now we need to do this other one. They should have troubleshot it right to start with. You got me? All right. So anyway, we put it, we're doing it. Which of the following is the least likely to cause an engine noise? Loose accessory drive belt, cracked exhaust manifold, carbon on the pistons, or a vacuum leak? Vacuum. Vacuum leak is least likely to cause an engine noise. All right. Least likely. We're, we're looking at least likely on that. Uh, of course, if a vacuum leak is bad enough, you're going to hear something going under the hood, but that's not really an engine noise per se. A good engine should produce how much compression during a dynamic compression test at idle? This is the compression gauge in the hole, engine running. What do you think? 60 to 90, uh, 60 to 90 psi. Now you're going to you're going to have lower compression with the engine running, lower measured compression than you are with the engine spinning. Why is that? Uh, volumetric efficiency. Yeah, when it's moving faster, it just can't get as much air. I don't know. Yep, there you go. A smoothly operating engine depends on what? Equally compression among the cylinders. Yep, equal compression among the cylinders. If it doesn't have even compression among the cylinders, it's because one of them is not going to be toting its share of the load, right? Uh, a good reading for a cylinder leakage test. Should, there's other things that a smoothly running engine desires, too. But a, a smoothly operating engine depends on equal compression among the cylinders. But a good reading for a cylinder leakage test would be what? A or D. D. That's actually all cylinders below 20% leakage. Now you remember the F-150 that they're changing that engine out in there, out there, had 70% leakage on cylinder number five. Four. Huh? Well, that truck you're working on? Four. No, it's five. It was the because uh, I remember distinctly that code was a PO305. And uh, see, they came in there, uh, Webb and Daniel were working on They came in there and they said, uh, it's PO305, it's skipping on cylinder number five, the injector's clicking, and the spark plug doesn't look bad. And I said, okay, let's check compression. So he checked compression with 70 pounds. It's supposed to be about twice that at least, right? So, uh, of course, you can check all the cylinders and see. But anyway, I said, okay, let's get it on top dead center with the valves closed, pump smoke in there. When we did, it came out the intake and, and burnt valve. Either burned or stuck open intake valve. That's what that was. Okay. 
Technician A says during a power balance test, the cylinder that causes the biggest RPM drop is the weak cylinder. Is that right? No. Technician B says if one spark plug wire is grounded out and the engine speed doesn't drop, when I say grounded out, you're going to take your test light, you're going to took it to ground, and you're going to use a probe of your test light. You're not going to pierce the wire. You're basically going to back probe it and ease it in there so the spark starts jumping to the test light instead of firing the plug. So you're basically going between the boot and the wire. And that test light's real tapered, it's easy to do that, but you don't want to stab a hole in the wire. I used to see people that poke a hole in that gun wire, you know, and that's just stupid. Because what happens is somebody reaches over close by there with a the motor running, it reaches out and touches someone. Why, bop, 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 you know, it'll light you up. All right, so anyway, um, the technician uh, B says if one spark plug wire is grounded out and the engine speed does not drop, a weak or a dead cylinder is indicated. That's B. Uh, let me ask you this, guys. What if you were working on a car like, like, like a distributor cap uh, engine like that one over there? Let's say that you had one that was running really ragged and you were pulling your plug wires one at a time and you got to one of the plug wires and when you pulled it off it ran better. Ooh. First time I ran into that I thought I was full of mud. And what happened was I looked and the firing order was right and everything. But when you pull that plug wire off it ran better. And I saw that several times. Interrupting it. Actually, it was. The problem was it had a carbon track on the inside of the distributor cap. Yeah, inside the distributor cap, it had been, you know, if somebody lets the spark plugs go too long without replacing them or there's too much resistance somewhere, mm -hmm. that spark's going to look for somewhere else to go. I'm sorry, it just is. And whenever it jumps, it's going to start making little carbon tracks. And that carbon track makes an easier current path than the way it's supposed to go. And so it would be jumping around hitting other cylinders and stuff. And if it hits cylinders, you know, and fires a cylinder that's, you know, that's at the wrong time, it's going to slow the engine down. Pull it off, it runs better. And I asked this one guy that, I said, what if you, you know, we were mechanicking together long years ago down there in Texas. And I said, what if I pull a plug wire off and it runs better? Because I was asking a question like I'm asking y'all. And he goes, and this guy was a good mechanic. He built a lot of engines and everything. He goes, I don't know. Maybe I ought to pull all of them off and it'll run real good. <laughs> but anyway, it was funny how that, and I saw a mechanic that was really seasoned at a Volkswagen place, was pulling plug wires, trying to find the one it was skipping. And I heard him, overheard him saying, I pull this one off and it runs better. I pull, I've never seen that before. I mean, I don't know why I hadn't seen it. I've seen it a bunch of times. Of course, I'd work at a filling station. He'd work at a dealership. <laughs> I mean, and I was at the dealership then. But he says, I said, check your, check your carbon track. And he, just, and he did, and it had one in it. But anyway, just keep that in mind. And you don't hardly ever see that much anymore. It was real common back in the 70s, you know. Uh, but anyway, um, let's see, uh, that was number seven we just did, wasn't it? Yeah. Cranking vacuum should be what? Three to six. What do you think, guys? The, uh, the book actually says that cranking vacuum should be higher than two and a half inches of mercury. Normal cranking vacuum is three to six inches of mercury. Oh, boy, I tell you what. But Lund the book. Lundy is on the ball. Uh, I had an issue with this one last night when I was going over it uh -huh. because it didn't have three to six, and I was like, "Well, it says right here three to six. Why does it not say right here?" Well, basically, you're going to look for the best answer to the question, you know. Because I will tell you this: in some of these cases, the guy that wrote the question is not the same guy that wrote the book. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? I mean, the, the the principles are all pretty much supposed to be universal, but. Uh, what I would look at in a situation like you're in, Lindy, I would know what the right numbers were. I'm going to pick the answer that's closest to the numbers that I know are right. That's the only way you can go there. If you're taking an ASE test, you basically have got to determine what it is, they're, how they're thinking, what it is they want, you know. I've actually seen ASE uh, tests like in the L1 Advanced Engine Performance where they would ask a question, they have a little table of scan tool readings that you're supposed to say, you're seeing this concern, these are your scan tool readings. Based on these scan tool readings, what do you think the problem is? And I would look, and the scan tool readings they put down for this particular problem didn't make sense. But there could only be one right answer, and I just picked the right answer that way, you know. Um, but you can, you can, you got to think, you, you got to do critical thinking when you're taking a test that you don't have an open book to. Technician A says a leak in head gasket can be checked using a chemical tester. Technician B says a leak in head gasket can be found using an exhaust analyzer. Uh, who's right about that? Both of them. Both of them are right. However, what about a, uh, a nitrile glove? Can I use a glove for that? 
put a glow over the exposed radiator cap. Mm -hmm. And that will find a leak. Let me tell you something. That will find a leak. That, I mean, I'm talking about a slight leak. If you're if you're wondering if you got a leak but you're not sure, that will find a leak that the uh, chemical tester will, will miss. Believe it or not. I love that. Yeah, and all that. Incidentally, um, Lundy, see this book right here, uh -huh. this particular issue of Motor Age. I don't have any articles in this one. This is a required reading for you since you read so much. Everything you get out of that issue, I read it last night, is really, really, really good. Uh, and it's, you know, it's that's a tremendously good issue. I mean, usually when I give magazines to people, they don't read them. But I figured I'd give you that because you read so. And the more you read, the smarter you're going to get. Le reader, leaders are readers. Or should I say readers are leaders? Works both ways, right? Okay, um, let me see here. The low oil pressure warning light comes on when? Uh, oil pressure drops dangerously low. Yeah, yeah, that sounds, that sounds pretty good. When oil pressure drops dangerously low, 4 to 7 PSI. I worked on a Dodge one time. It was a pickup that belonged to our company when I was doing fleet maintenance down there. And they were saying, the oil light's coming on on this truck. And so uh, I said, well, hmm. So uh, let me put them, uh, I went ahead and temporarily hooked up a, uh, a regular gauge on it. And it was a little bit low, but, uh, you know, it, did, it wasn't clattering the lifters or anything. And I was figuring it was some other anomaly going on. And uh, believe it or not, about three days later, they were driving that truck, and the crankshaft broke. <laughs> well, the reason the crankshaft broke was because it was already cracked. And that's where the oil pressure was going. Oh. You see, it had a 318 in it. And so uh, I got a 360 and put back in it, you know, because gas in those days was 40 cents a gallon. <laughs> anyway, I says, uh, so I, when I bought a, a, a short block. And here's another funny story. You're talking about engine repair. Now, this guy that worked in the, uh, now you guys, who, you guys know the difference between a short block and a long block before I tell this story? When you're buying up, when you're buying up an engine and the parts guy says, do you want a short block or a long block? Right? So since nobody's answering that question, this story right here probably won't help a whole lot. A short block is the block with the crankshaft and the pistons in it. And that's all. You got no heads on it or anything. It's just the bottom end, right? Crankshaft and piston. That's a short block. You can buy a short block, have your heads reworked, and you got you a new engine, right? Or you got a rebuilt engine. A long block has the heads and the valve covers on it. It's built all the way up. So it includes the heads. Oh, this is therefore it's for the wise, okay? And so uh, now I feel silly telling this story. But this guy that was sweeping the floor went into the parts room and he was talking to the people in the parts department about uh, he needed an engine for his wife's uh, vehicle, whatever it was, Aerostar, I think it was. And they says, uh, do you want a short block or a long block? And he sort of blinked his eyes. He didn't know what they were talking about. And so he came out there where me and this truck mechanic were standing there talking. And uh, he says... Can you get one of you guys come out here and look at my wife's air store and tell me if I have a short block or a long block in there? And the truck, and the truck mechanic looked at me and says, I'm going to let you handle this one. <laughs> but anyway, you know, knowing that now, he didn't know. I mean, you know, he just basically, they were asking him a question he didn't know how to answer, you know. But, uh, anyway, that's pretty funny. Okay, um, which of the following is a complaint related to engine problems? Yeah, they got uh, smoke, misfire, oil consumption, all of these. Now, Lundy's going after this oil consumption problem on this Escort, uh, basically. You remember how you crank the Escort up and fill the put white smoke comes out in the exhaust? He's going to try to fix that. And incidentally, he's got to rework the cylinder head, too. There's, a, there's some sheets he's doing that. What does the black exhaust smoke indicate? Test fuel. That's yeah, typically going to be hydrocarbons. That's unburned fuel. What does blue exhaust smoke indicate? Burning oil. You're burning some oil there, man. What does white smoke, exhaust smoke indicate? Yeah. Coolant in the combustion chamber. Now, unless it's a diesel, you know, diesel white smoke can be too much fuel, you know. Uh, technician A checks for gasoline in the oil by holding a match to the dipstick. Um, no. Technician B checks for water in the oil by dripping a small amount on a hot manifold to see if it bubbles. Yep. Uh, actually, both of those guys are right, believe it or not. You know, I'll tell you something else you can do. You can take a paper towel like one of these paper towels we got here, and pull some oil out and drip it on it. And that oil, if you see something run, you know, wicking away from that drop of oil, you know, soaking in, then you got either, you know, water or fuel and the oil that way. 
Now, if you've gone a long time without changing your oil, you're going to have gasoline contaminated engine oil. You got me? And the reason I stopped to tell you this stuff, I'm not going to forget it if I don't. This is not a funny story. But uh, if you've got gasoline in the engine oil, like for instance, let's say that you've, you've worked on one that there's got an injector that just sprayed fuel through, you know, and it's got too much gasoline. And you fix the problem. Or maybe the, the diaphragm and the fuel pressure regulator ruptured. And, you know, you pull the hose off the fuel pressure regulator and gasoline comes out of there. You know you got a bad fuel pressure regulator. Well, where's that gasoline going? It's going through that hose into the intake, and it's making it in its way in, you know, lots of, into the pistons. And a lot of gasoline blow by is making it into the crankcase. And now all of a sudden, you know, after you've done all of your fixing, you fix the fuel, you know, injector, fuel pressure regulator, whatever, the thing still runs like trash, and the fuel trims are bad, and all this kind of thing. Got me? All right, so I'm saying, what the sound hill is going on here? So what do you need to do next? You need to change the oil. Change engine oil. Now here's another little diagnostic story. My dad had a 91 Chrysler. My dad was a mechanic for years and years and years. You know, he didn't work on a lot of new stuff, but he worked on up until. And I says, uh, he says, uh, your, the power loss light on your mama's Chrysler is on. And I said, well, turn the key on three times and count the blinks. He goes, I'm not fooling with that. He said, I don't want you no blinking light. I said, Okay, Dad, let me come over and see about it. So I switch it on three times, I got a code 17. And that means that it's running too cold, like a PO 128, like we kind of like we got on this one that you looked at, right? Except that's what Chrysler has 17. Okay, so when one's running too cold, it's also running too rich, right? Got me? Yeah. Okay, but anyway, but he couldn't tell there was anything wrong with it. He said, well, I can put a thermostat in it. I said, we'll do that. So he put a thermostat in it, you know, bled it out, got a thermostat open, everything's fine. And then he says, well, it's been a while since I've changed oil. I think I'll go to the, my shop and change oil. So I took it out. He still had his shop in the country. Um, wasn't working out of it anymore. But he pulled his car in there, raised it up, drained the crankcase, oil and filter, puts it back together, and now the car won't idle. Crank it up, goes dead. Crank it up, goes dead. Crank it up, hold the gas, it stay up, let off, it goes dead. He calls me up. All I did was change the oil, and now the car won't idle. What are you going to tell him? You got to fix this over a phone because he's reaching critical mass. Okay. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So I told him what to do. I said, take the battery cable off for a couple of minutes, put it back on, you'll be good to go. So he did. Boom. Out of perfectly. Got it? Anybody ever change a battery at O'Reilly's and all of a sudden their Dodge wouldn't idle anymore? No, that never happened. It will. It'll happen. You're going to see it sooner or later. I changed the battery. The battery you sold me must not be good because no my truck won't idle. Adaptive learning, guys. This is what's going on. The cold running car, long time no oil change, got the crankcase all saturated. PCV systems pulling that vapor through there. Oxygen sensors picking it up. Engine controllers saying, well, we're going to retard the fuel trim a little bit, take some fuel away so we can make it, you know, run like it's supposed to have clean exhaust coming out the back. Now all of a sudden that gas ain't in there no more. And it's already used its adaptive learning tables to compensate, you know, to accommodate that. And now he's put fresh grain case in there with no oil. And it's, so it doesn't know what to do. It's like having a carburetor saddle adjustment. Take the battery cables off. And I like to clean the throttle body too. Take the battery cables off, put it back on, let it start over like a brand new car again, and he's good to go. See what I'm saying? Now, the the the... The dummy at this point would go to the parts store and buy lots of parts, which really helps Lundy's cash flow over in the parts store. You know what I'm saying? He used to sell sell lots of parts. You're supposed to sell what, fifteen hundred dollars a week or something? Yeah, and so that helps you if you can make it convince them that they need this and they need that and need the other. You know. All right. Anyway, I'm not saying Lundy does that, but all right. Now then, just keep that in mind. It's really, really important. Uh, but if you want to drip some on a napkin and watch and see if it runs off, try that. You know, if you got one that hadn't had the oil change in it a long time, drip a little bit of oil on a napkin and see if something runs from it. And if it does, you know, it's you got some uh, gasoline in there. Uh, let's see. Technician A says never to remove the radiator cap from a hot engine. <laughs> well, that's a no-brainer, isn't it? You can burn yourself. Technician B says leaking coolant may cause a grayish-white stain. We talked about that on a previous question. That's going to be C. Red fluid is found leaking under the vehicle. Transmission fluid. Now, could it also be coolant? Some of them have red coolant. You're right. Basically, um, 
most likely is transmission fluid though. But if it's coolant, well, and some people put, some people use transmission fluid for power steering fluid. That's what the Humvees do. You know, they just pour the power steering fluid in there. And if it's got a red leak, you better, if it's red, it could be if they're using power, you know, what's in the power steering reservoir? You know, that's what I want to know. But usually the power steering fluid, if it's been in there a long time, is a dark color. How often should you change your power steering fluid? Once every 37 years. How often should you change power steering fluid? Mm -hmm. Once a year. Did you know General Motors has got a procedure for doing that? but they really don't have a schedule for how often it's supposed to be done. However, your oil change places like to sell those. The only problem is, how can you tell if they did it or not? Unless you're pretty sure, you know, because a lot of people don't even know where their power steering. Oh, this was funny. This one kid out here on the, this morning, uh, uh, one of the uh, Saunders, I mean, the guy that was, I said, okay, you got this sheet, you got to look, bring your vehicle up here and let's check it out. He's driving an 06 Explorer. And he opens the hood and every darn thing's low. His power steering fluid is low, his brake fluid is low, his coolant's low, his engine oil is low, everything's low. <laughs> that was a really good lesson. The other guy opens his hood and a stupid belt tensioner is coming apart. Wow. I mean, it's a, the, the pulley's all crooked and you can see the spring. And I said, I wouldn't start for town on that boy. He said, well, i got to go back to Andalusia and let my dad put a belt tensioner on it. <laughs> that was funny. I'm having them do these inspections on their vehicles and their stuff's falling apart, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That was that was comical. Well, I mean, I hope they learned something from that. All right. So. Thank you. I thought it was funny when you told you, oh, this stuff should be good. I just got it done. Yeah, why was it low? Yeah, it was low. <laughs> Everything was low. Literally, every fluid on that truck. I don't need to check transmission. Every fluid was low on that Explorer, and he was really feeling silly. Uh, okay, let me see. All the following statements are correct, except, and this is an ASE style question, you see these all the time on ASE tests and I don't like them myself. Uh, engine degreaser often uses engine heat to dissolve grease. Is that true or is that false? That is true. Avoid high pressure rinsing of ignition wires or distributor caps. That's true. Uh, leak detecting dye should be used with a black light. True. It's normal for an engine to stall with when sprayed with water. Definitely not true. That's not true. However, I'll tell you something else that happens when you high pressure wash. You know these little connectors that got weather pack seals in them, the electrical connectors under the hood? If you hit them just the wrong way, you can actually force water into that connector and you can have other problems. And uh, this one guy brings a truck in that's been, he was a the goofy guy that was, uh, I, really, I liked the guy, but he kind of was a hillbilly. You know, he, kinda, he had a big beard and when I asked him, why didn't you grab your brother by the beard and jerk him around? He said, how did you know my brother had a beard? Because he had a beard, you know. But anyway, I says, uh, he says, I, I put the engine back in his Ranger, and now it's black smoking and running terrible. And it won't idle right, and I know I got everything tight. And so I went over there, and I said, wait a minute. This is the one you had sitting out in the weather for the last two weeks waiting on parts, isn't it, with the hood off of it and all these connectors pointing up at the sky and all this rain falling? And I said, unplug one of these connectors. So we unplug a connector, we hit it with the air hose, my hand's all wet. What's all this doing in here? you got to dry these connectors out, man. All that water is going to be conducting signals and confuse everybody. So he blew all the connectors out and it ran like a sewing machine. You see where I'm going? But if you hit it with a high-pressure washer, I will have that issue too. You get me? That's really important to keep that in mind. All right, so anyway, that uh, 18 uh, is going to be D, and we're half done here pretty much. Which is the most noticeable at idle? Hey. Her vehicle's not ready. Tell her we still got to do the uh, finish the timing belt. It's probably going to be Monday. Tell her it's probably going to be Monday. Uh, we still got to. All right. So um, that was that was the one you're working on and all that. You, know, you got to put the water pump back on there and find another bolt and just go. Oh, another bolt. Yeah. Cool. All right. That's cool. All right. So um, let me see. Which of the noise, which noise is most noticeable at idle? A valve lifter. B worn thrust bearings. C piston slap. D main bearing knock. Alpha. Valve lifters. Valve lifters are most noticeable at idle. What are you usually thinking of when you hear valve lifters? What's that telling you? Usually it means low on oil because that's the first thing it's going to start when you're running low on oil. Um, which of the that doesn't necessarily mean that you're low on oil. It can mean that you got some kind of a something. We had a incidentally we had a, a, a Dodge Caravan out here that was making a bunch of lifter racket, and if it's full of oil, now she had run it low on oil, and it was you know, but it had a bunch of uh, 
lifter racket, I mean this nasty lifter racket. So we had good oil pressure, 70 pounds, and it was full of oil, um, but it was making a bunch of lifter racket because I believe one of the cam bearings or something had spun a little bit and it blocked the passage and there wasn't any oil getting to the lifters. Now I've still got that engine over there. We never have torn it down to see what was wrong. <laughs> you know, we had to put another motor in it, but uh, anyway. Uh, technician A says low oil pressure causes engine wear. Technician B says... Wait a minute, excuse me, which of the following is least likely to cause a rattle sound? That's number 20. Um, what do you think? What, who said that? Got a crack, crack, crack. Yeah. Um, that is really interesting to me that they would say that because a cracked flex plate always causes a rattle sound. That's stupid. Now, I say that. There may be somebody somewhere that's seen a cracked flex, flex, flex plate that didn't cause a rattle sound, but when I've seen it, it rattles. And you'll hear it going, and you'll think or something. When you get your stethoscope and use it for a listening pipe, and you go all over the place. I'm not talking about touching anything. Just listen with a pipe. And when you go up in the bell housing area, it's really noisy up in there. you got a crack flywheel, typically. We've seen that more than one time here at the school. Um, but, I mean, that's, I don't even like that question. I would not, if I'd have written this test, I would not have put that question there. But, according to what they're saying, uh, 20 is right. I don't know. Those people haven't seen what I've seen, I don't guess. Technician A says low oil pressure causes engine wear. Technician B says engine wear causes low oil pressure. Yeah. <laughs> Both of them. Both of them are right. Yeah. Because when the bearings get loose, I mean, the bearings start to wear out, like you see a lot of copper on those bearings on the escort over there, and the place that's, you know, those slop that's between the loose bearings and the crankshaft is going to allow oil pressure to squirt out. Cam bearings or something else can cause that. And all that. Now remember, listen to this. If you want to see if you got any kind of an oil pressure leak anywhere, and you can get to the place where the oil pump puts the oil into the oil gallery, or you can take your oil sending unit out, right? Take your oil sending unit out, and let's put air pressure in there. Just put shop air in there. Got me? I mean, like, well, I say shop air. Depends on what your shop air pressure is. If you got 90 pounds of shop air pressure, the oil filter will hold that. You put too much shop air pressure in there, it blow the oil filter off. And if that's the case, it makes a mistake. I mean, big mess. Put air pressure in there and see if you hear oil air you're going shh somewhere. If you hear it going shh, you hear that, find out where it's coming from. If you see it squirting out around the cam bearings, you know, you're doing this because you got low oil pressure, right? To begin with. Let's say my oil pressure starts out as reading forty pounds, when it gets hot it's down to about six pounds. I don't know where that's going, right? Let's say somebody's already put an oil pump on it, because they assume the oil pump was bad. And the relief valve's been checked. Because if the relief valve sticks, you'll have low oil pressure too. Looking at all this engine repair stuff. Uh, some of these are engine repair questions, more than they are emission questions, but they still work. Put that pressure in there, that's where you find it. Um, you can also uh, stop up the PCV and the crankcase closure and put about 15 pounds of air pressure on the crankcase and find oil leaks that way, too, with the, with blower, with the uh, soap bubbles. So that's another way you can do that. All right, let me see here. Let me see, let me see. Um, all the following statements are correct except oil pressure testing should be done at normal oil temper normal operating temperature. Right. Recommended oil pressure is one psi for every thousand RPM. Not correct. That's not correct. It's supposed to be ten psi for every thousand RPM. That's the minimum. Um, technician A says to check oil pressure with a manual gauge if the oil pressure warning light's on. Uh, he's right about that. Technician A B says a faulty electrical circuit causes oil pressure warning light to come on even when the oil pressure is good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's both those guys are right. That ain't complicated. Which of the following could result in low engine compression? <coughs> Cylinder head gasket, damaged oh, valve, oh. damaged piston oh. ring, all of the above are correct. Uh, 25, when preparing for a compression test, technician A disables the ignition system. Technician B only removes the spark plug from the cylinder which is being tested. Actually, you disable the ignition system, but you're really supposed to remove all the spark plugs if you're going to do a comprehensive compression test. You got me? So both? Huh? So just A. Yeah, that's basically going to be A on this one, yeah. All right, you ready? All right. Okay, now then, so what number am I on? Uh, 26. How many compression strokes should be used during a compression test? How many puffs? Huh? He's saying four. Uh, I've heard people say four. I've heard people say, huh? Yeah, I like six. Six is my favorite number. And uh, 
you know, basically there's other people that agree with that. No, no fewer than four, but I like six. You know? Sometimes you got to replace that little Schrader valve in your compressor gauge too, because it'll get to where it won't hold pressure. The gauge will just bounce and go back to zero over time. It's aggravating when that happens. Um, but you can replace that little Schrader valve just like one in a tire. Um, let me see. Number 27. When performing a cylinder leakage test, the following statements are correct except uh, A. Air is heard escaping through the tailpipe may indicate a defective exhaust valve. That's true. Shop air should be applied to the dipstick tube. Not for that, not for a cylinder leakage test. When performing a cylinder leakage test, the technician A says 20% leakage is acceptable. Uh, technician B says a cylinder will show too much leakage if the piston is not at TDC on its compression stroke. That's both those guys are right. I think uh, Daniel and, and Webb were doing that the other day. Yeah, 70%. Uh, 70%, big time. And it was leaking out the, and you, and you were on TDC compression. Furthermore, another thing was it had only 70 pounds of compression, so that's the thing too. 29, a cylinder power balance test is being performed. Cylinder 1, 2, and 3 all drop 175 RPM when disabled with a scan tool. You know, some 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 engines will let you drop cylinders with a scan tool, turn them off with a scan tool instead of having to pull the injectors or whatever. Uh, cylinder 4 drops 50 RPM when disabled. The following statements are correct except A, there may be a mechanical problem with 4. Cylinder 4 is weaker than 1, 2, and 3. Cylinder 4 is stronger than 1, 2, and 3. Or it could also be conducted by grounding a plug wire for each cylinder. 29 is actually C. Um, let's see. Wait a minute. I don't really like that answer that they said there. That just doesn't sound right to me. If the cylinder power balance is being performed, and one, two, and three drop 175 RPM, but four only drops 50, then that right answer ought to be B, not C. Because if it doesn't drop as much, it means it's a weaker cylinder to begin with. Now that's a bad. Uh, Deal on. That's a bad answer key. That's, that's B, not C. Fix that. Technician A says removing the plug wire from a spark plug while the engine is running could damage ignition system components. That spark is going to find somewhere to go, people. It's going to go screaming back through something that you don't want it to damage. Technician B says grounding a spark plug wire while the engine is running could damage ignition system components. That's A only. If you ground the spark plug wire, you're basically shortening the ground. You're not hurting the doggone thing that way. 31, which is not a step in the cranking vacuum test. A, connect the vacuum gauge to the source of manifold vacuum. You know that's a step. Has to be, right? B, crank the engine while observing the vacuum gauge. C, block the throttle wide open. D, disable ignition or fuel system. That's actually going to be C. What happens if you block the throttle wide open? Why is that not a good idea? You ain't got no vacuum. That way, right? I mean, where's, how's vacuum created? The throttle plate's closed, the pistons are actually creating low pressure, and it's pulling against the throttle plate. Got me? So if you block the throttle wide open, you're going to be cranking vacuum showing up, right? <laughs> Just use your common sense. Um, let's see. Normal engine vacuum and idle is what? 17 That's a good answer. You can look at your vacuum gauge, look at the green area and tell that. Technician A says a low but steady idle vacuum reading indicates a sticking valve. Excuse me? Technician B says that a fluctuating vacuum gauge indicates reading indicates incorrect ignition timing. Ah, no. That's basically, if you see the vacuum gauge bouncing, and we didn't even look at the vacuum on that forge y'all were checking the other day. But if you see the vacuum gauge bouncing. Let me ask you this. Can an exhaust valve, a burned exhaust valve, cause the intake vacuum to bounce? Or is that only a burned intake valve? Or stuck open intake valve? Or too tight intake valve? What do you think? You'd be surprised. A burned exhaust valve can make the vacuum bounce in the intake. Basically can. Why? 
You guys got to have critical thinking skills polished here. Why can a burned exhaust valve cause intake manifold vacuum gauge fluctuation? It can and it will. Why? Think about what's going on in there, guys. We got pistons going up and down. We got valves opening and closing. Doesn't the exhaust valve have to be closed for it to create low pressure? Yeah, I was going to say. If the exhaust valve is open and it's sucking back in from the exhaust instead of, you know, pulling on the intake, it's not able to pull it all the way from you're going to have a bouncer. From the exhaust as well. You may see that next week. Right? Hmm? And, you know, you can ask this. You can, you can ask Matt. You can say, look, I've got no cylinder leakage and I've got no compression. What's wrong? I've got no compression. I've got no cylinder leakage. Why? Ask him that. See what he says. You know how gung-ho he is. You know he's gonna be all over that. And it's happened here. We've had it happen here. I've talked. I've told that story before. All right. Yeah, that's a good question, isn't it? All right. Let me see. Which of the following is not a cause of high exhaust back pressure? A. Restricted exhaust pipe. B. Restricted catalytic converter. C. Restricted muffler. D, vacuum leak. D. I was riding this car one time with this guy that just had a new muffler put on his car. A little Chevrolet. And he really got on it. Oh, and it blew the muffler off the car. It was laying in the road back there behind us. <laughs> it blew the muffler off the doggone car. And somebody had just stuck a muffler on there that would fit. <laughs> and it had too much back pressure for that car. The engine was putting out more back pressure than that muffler could handle. And it blew the muffler, slammed off the car. Brand new muffler, shiny muffler, laying in the road back there with the tailpipe hooked to it, you know, and he went and go back and pick it up. I've seen mufflers fall off of cars while they're driving. Yeah, I saw that too. I've uh, never seen one get blown off. Exhaust back pressure of an engine running at idle should be what? What should the exhaust back pressure be, and how would you measure that anyway? Uh, the oxygen Less than one and a half psi. Sensor. That's a good plan. Take the oxygen sensor out, put a fitting in there, it's got a hose. I've got a tool here that's made for that somewhere, if I can find it. But anyway, you screw the oxygen sensor out, you put a fitting on there, it's got a hose nipple on it, put a hose on there, look at your gauge, have somebody rev it up. Even riven it up, you ought not to have over one and a half PSI. One time, what we did, and what muffler shops do, you know what they do? This is what a muffler shop does. Right in front of the muffler, he drills a one eighth hole. And then he just takes a hose and with a pressure gauge and holds it up against that hole. Oh, somebody else here to it up. <laughs> it works. And you know what? If he doesn't have a, if he, if that's not the problem, he puts a blind pop rivet in the hole. Click. Doesn't hurt a dead gum thing. Wow. And that's how quick you can do it. You know, how fast you want to know something. And we had one here. And the temperature gun test lied to us. In front of the catalytic converter, it should not be hotter than behind the catalytic converter, right? If you went into the catalytic converter, it should be like 200 degrees. Coming out, it ought to be several hundred degrees, four or five hundred degrees, because the heat's all being generated in the catalyst, right? Well, if obviously if the catalyst is clogged up, it's piling up in front of the catalyst, and your temperature gun should show that. And we have a 2001 model Monte Carlo or something, and this thing was running like a dog going down the road. So we checked it, and it read 210 degrees here. 450 degrees back there. That's not a good test every time. Now, if it's hot in front of the catalytic converter, it is a good test. If it's reading normally, that don't mean the catalytic converter is not stopped up. And what we did do is we did what I'm talking about. Right in front of the catalyst, poked a little one eighth hole, and I had Jesse James Duke, the guy that was whose pictures on the window out here, you know, that hose up again there. And it was real hot under there, and he was all kind of you know, a real strained look on his face, and the, it pegged out the gauge. Wow. It, it was supposed to be less than one and a half, and it bounced that gauge all the way as far as it could go. That's how much pressure it had. And we pulled the catalyst off, and you could look into it, and you could see where particles from that ver vermiculite blanket had come off and had clogged the cat up. It was terrible. We put another catalytic converter on it, and they were good to go. I got a motor age article out of that one. But you see what I'm saying? You want to find a test that's going to tell you the truth every time. Got me? Now, some tests that we do on components are only valid when it fails the test. You got me? That makes sense? They're, just because it passes the test doesn't mean that component's not bad. That's what I was, you know, you, it may pass a temperature test. That doesn't mean that catalytic converter is not restricted. If it fails the temperature test, however, 
The catalyst is the next logical step. But do not shoot it with a temperature gun, see normal temperatures, and think you've eliminated that cat because you haven't. The only acid test for knowing if you got too much exhaust restriction is measuring the pressure in front of the cat. And that'll tell you the truth every single time. The temperature gun won't always tell you the truth. It's telling the truth when it fails it, but if it passes that test, that may not be true. Alternator diode check. Remember what I'm talking about that? Take your diode check on your alternator, and you go from the big post to the body of the alternator, and then you swap them around. You should read one way and not read the other way. If it fails that test, you got a bad alternator. If it passes that test, it doesn't mean the alternator is good. It just means that it passed that test. There's other things that can go wrong in an alternator. Am I clear on this? Everybody getting what I'm telling you? I'm trying to make sure that you... you exactly. Yeah, that's what I'm saying instead of thinking that, you know, well, that's okay. I can go on to something else. I've seen people when they're trying to get a no-start going. They hold their spark. The, the, the books all say, let it jump a quarter of an inch. And if it's got a quarter of an inch, you've checked your spark. And they work, work, work. Well, I got spark there. And then they go looking all over the rest of the truck for every problem. Well, the thing about it is if you try to stretch your spark and it don't stretch out to where it's like lightning and scare the daylights out of you, you didn't check it good enough. It'll be an orange spark. It'll be kind of weak. It ain't going to start no car. If it's a weak spark and it won't stretch out to about an inch long, you better be looking at a call. Got me? And I've seen people do that. They get thrown for a loop because they got a little bit of a quarter inch spark and they feel like that's all they need to get. Lamont did that. He went to the... So the Nissan place, and I had him working on a Cadillac. It was a used car. He says, this thing won't start, and it's got spark and everything. And I said, Lamont, what does the spark look like? Huh? I said, what does it look like? What color is it? Well, it's kind of an orange color, and it'll jump a quarter of an inch. I said, if it won't jump more than a quarter inch, you better put a coil on it. And so he put a coil on it. But he'd already been all over that car looking for everything else, because he, see, he felt like he was okay, because he had that. Make sure that you know how to interpret test results, and don't think that everything's fine just because it passed some silly little... Yes, it didn't have a backup. All right. Okay. Everybody has a clearly defined objective.